Good evening, everyone. My name is Ethan Nchusi. I'm from the Biodesign and Innovation Committee. Um, we are all here tonight for our presentation on intellectual property protection of medical devices. Um, just so that you guys all know, this presentation will be recorded and posted on YouTube underneath RFS Education. If any of you guys have questions during this presentation, you can go ahead and just type your question in the chat box and we will get to your question at the end of the webinar. All right, and tonight with us we have uh, our committee member, John Filthus, who will be introducing our speaker. Go ahead, John. Hello, good evening, everyone. As Ethan said, my name is John Filthus. I'm a third year medical student from SUNY Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. I'm glad you could all join us today. It is my privilege to introduce to you Peter D. Sleeman. He is a patent attorney and co-founder of Way and Sleeman a boutique intellectual property law firm serving clients globally. Peter has deep-rooted interest in biodesign and innovation. He attended Rutgers University, where he received a bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering. Thereafter, he earned a Juris Doctorate degree from Seton Hall University, where he studied with a concentration on intellectual property law. Before founding his law firm, Peter gained valuable experience at the esteemed intellectual property boutique of Darby and & Darby and later at Lerner David. Peter's practice focuses on patent procurement and counseling. He has represented a broad range of clients before the United States Patent and Trademark Office and has collaborated with, with associates from the European Patent Office, the Japanese Patent Office, the Canadian Patent Office, and others. Peter is a jack of most trades, practicing in a wide range of technologies, including mechanical devices and electronic hardware and software. He is a master of at least one, however. His primary focus has been the representation of several Fortune 500 companies in the medical device industry, including Boston Scientific and St. Jude Medical. In connection with an array of medical devices, including transcatheter heart valve replacements, embolic protection, spinal cord and deep brain stimulation, microcatheters, ultrasound transducers, pattern recognition imaging, balloon angioplasty, drug infusion systems, microstimulators, neurovascular intervention, lead insertion methods, hemodialysis, cochlear implants, infrared thermometers, continuous positive airway pressure systems, orthodontics, radiation therapy, sterilization techniques, tents, and heart valve repair. He has worked extensively in the fields of cardiology, neurology, and radiology. Peter enjoys practicing at the fascinating intersection of law, engineering, and medicine. He has written articles concerning the important role physicians have in medical innovation and is a member of the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs. His presence with us tonight is a testament to his dedication to medical innovation. When he's not working with his clients, Peter enjoys reading about many different subjects, including theology and philosophy. He's also an avid sports fan and enjoys rooting for his beloved Green Bay Packers. Thank you, Peter, for taking the time to be with, here with us tonight and talking to us IR trainees. Please take it away. Um, thank you, John. Thank you for the uh, very lovely introduction, and uh, go Pack Go. Um, today, we're going to be talking about intellectual property and how to protect medical devices. Uh, this is a topic that's near and dear to me. Um, I find it a very fascinating one. So, um, a little bit about myself, if I could get this going. Um, so like John said, you know, I was a uh, biomedical engineer before law school. Uh, I've worked at a couple of IP firms before starting my own. And uh, now I work with a lot of medical device manufacturers and physicians. And um, if you want and you have more questions after this session, feel free to keep my contact information and contact me directly. We're going to cover uh, five main topics today. Um, and then after that, I think we'll take some time for questions. Uh, first, we're going to talk about what is IP, and uh, we'll focus most on patents, and uh, I'll give you an idea of some patent basics. After that, we'll talk about patent ownership and uh, IP ownership in general. Then we'll talk about finding partners, and if we have a chance, we'll talk about a couple success stories. So what is IP? And uh, this is just the basics here. Um, most clients that call, um, some are, are pretty sophisticated and know what they're looking for. Um, others don't really know the difference between 
uh, what a patent does, what a trademark does, and what a copyright does. And uh, one of the main jobs that we do is to counsel people and educate them on the differences. Um, to start, um, we could talk about how the government um, has the, created the, um, the patent laws and the federal laws to try to promote innovation. And uh, this comes right from the Constitution, Article 1. It says that Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts. Um, and this is very powerful. This is really where um, everything uh, comes from in terms of IP, um, this Article 1, Section 8. So there's several types, as I mentioned. There's patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets. And um, they're all different in what they protect and how they protect them. Uh, but understand that with a certain product uh, or a certain project, you may end up having multiple layers of IP protection. Um, and obviously, we'll focus most on patents today, uh, but just to give you an idea uh, of the differences between them. So um, I'll start with copyright. Copyright protects artistic expression. Uh, most people know copyright will covers things like books, photos, music, film, um, any song lyrics that you may have uh, seen, uh, that would be covered by copyright. And uh, typically, the protection for copyright is the life of the author plus 70 years. Next, we have trademarks, and uh, trademark just serves to protect the identifier that serves as an origin of a good or service. So when you look at the Starbucks logo, for example, the name and the logo, um, the, the, the logo on, say, a Starbucks um, cup, that is supposed to signify where that good comes from. Um, it shows where the origin of that good is. And trademark can last as long as the business continues to use the mark. So there's no expiration date for trademarks. One that most people don't know about, um, which is a kind of IP, are trade secrets. And that's just confidential information that gives you some sort of business advantage. So when you think about the Coca-Cola formula, that's a very famous one in terms of people talking about trade, trade secrets. Uh, the Coca-Cola formula, um, it's not patented. Um, and in order to know what the formula is, uh, you would have to work for them and know that information. So the problem obviously with trade secret is that once that information goes out to the public, it's no longer protected. So if someone were able to uh, reverse engineer what that formula is, they could make it and Coca-Cola would have no remedy uh, under the law. Um, so the protection for trade secret obviously lasts as long as information remains confidential. Um, and finally, we'll start again with, with patents, uh, which is going to be really uh, the heart of the subject here today. And patents will protect inventions. Um, examples for that are new catheters or bone fixation devices, uh, new methods of delivering a catheter, for example, that would be covered by patents. And the protection is typically 20 years from the first non-provisional application that's filed. Uh, there's also something called a design patent and for that, you get 14 years. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about the differences between design patents and utility patents in a couple of minutes. So just the basics here on patents. A patent will give an inventor the right to exclude others from performing certain activities in the country of issuance. So uh, some people are confused. They think that patents give them the right to make, say, a device or a catheter. That's not true. It's a, it's, it gives you the right to exclude others. So you could make whatever it is that you want to make without ever having to get a patent. And certainly some businesses uh, bypass the whole IP um, issue entirely and are able to make products um, and compete in other ways. So having a patent, uh, while it's very valuable, it's not necessary for you to uh, make a product. And a patent is basically a sanctioned monopoly by the government for a certain number of years in exchange for disclosure to the public. So you basically trade uh, a disclosure that says exactly how you make your device or how your method works. And um, in order for you to get 20 years um, for you to have as a monopoly in order to make this exclusively, um, you give that disclosure to the public. Um, there's two main types of patents. Um, one would be utility patents, the other one would be design patents. There's also plant patents, but that's outside the scope of tonight's discussion. 
and uh, utility patents will protect functionality. So uh, you're looking at things like the protecting devices, um, methods, systems, all that would be covered by utility patents. Now, the other way that you could um, have a patent or the other type would be design patents. And those typically protect the ornamental, non-functional elements of a device. So if you look on the right, there is a picture here uh, of a heart valve that, you know, I've worked on this for, for a number of years. This was one of kind of my earlier projects. And uh, you'll see there in uh, this transcatheter heart valve, there's going to be certain functional elements that are going to be protected by utility patents. Um, but there's also things about the design that are non-functional. Uh, they just serve to make the device, you know, yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a better look for the device or um, it, it's, a, it's a little bit sleeker, but it doesn't have a, a functional purpose. Those could be protected by uh, design patents. One very famous design patent case that you might have heard of is, you know, a few years ago, there was um, this controversy between Apple and Samsung, and Apple had multiple design patents on the way that the iPhone looked on the rounded corners. So that would be the type of thing that you're looking at for design patents. So let's talk about patentability there for a sec. Um, when is a claim patentable? When is a patent claim uh, patentable? How do you get protection? Well, I'm going to talk about patent claims in a couple of minutes, uh, but for now, just understand that a patent claim is the thing that needs to be protected. And we'll dig in a little bit more as to what a claim actually means, uh, because that's a legal term. Uh, so first, in order to be patentable, you have to have eligible subject matter. So you can't, for example, patent a law of nature or some sort of abstract idea. Um, typically devices uh, would always fall under eligible subject matter. Um, second, um, your claim has to be novel. That means it's not previously known or used by others. So novel just means that the exact device, for example, um, was not out there um, in public uh, previously. Um, the third one, which is really kind of the heart of what we do, is non-obviousness. So most people understand that uh, if I have a device and I do a search and I don't see something exactly like it, that means that I might have something that's patentable. Uh, but what they fail to realize is that there's this other requirement of non-obviousness that says that even if a new invention differs in one or more ways from another patented invention, a patent may still be refused by the patent office if the differences would be obvious. So keep in mind that the patent examiner is looking at multiple references and comparing those references against your patent application. And um, he or she may be able to combine those references to show that your invention was obvious. So one example, let's say that you have a claim. And claim one recites a catheter made of a polymer and the catheter has two passageways. The examiner may cite reference A, which shows a metallic catheter with two passageways, but it's not polymeric. And reference B, which shows a polymeric catheter with one passageway. So neither reference A nor reference B here destroy the novelty of the invention. But the, exa the examiner may take these two references and say that it would have been obvious to combine references A and B to arrive at the applicant's claim. So that's what we talk about when we talk about non-obviousness. This ability of the examiner to make certain modifications and reject your patent application over multiple references. And there's no limit as to how many references he could reject your application over. So if he has, um, or if you have a claim that has 10 different features and the examiner finds 10 different references or more that have those features, he's able to piece together rejection that includes 10 different references. Um, and obviously the more references that are pieced together, the more the rejection begins to fall apart and it has certain weaknesses. Um, but the takeaway here from this screen is that if nothing else, understand that non-obviousness will play a key role in whether or not you get a patent granted. Um, we can shift gears here a little bit and talk about who is an inventor. What does it take to be an inventor on a patent application? So an inventor is a party who has contributed to at least one claim of a patent. And again, note that word claim, and we'll talk again about what that word claim means. 
the naming of inventors is very crucial to the validity of a patent. So if you intentionally fail to name or incorrectly identify an inventor, that can result in a patent being held invalid. Um, so getting the right inventors is crucial. Um, making sure that you have exactly the people that are inventors, um, not less and not more. Um, and it's very crucial to talk to a patent attorney and make sure that you've discussed who should be an inventor and why. Sometimes people will work on an invention and not rise to the level of inventorship. So I'll give you two examples. Um, someone who follows instructions or does all the experiments with direction from another person is likely not an inventor. So if you came up with a new device and that new device, um, you needed someone to just basically operate as a pair of hands and put it together for you, that person would not be an inventor as long as he's just following your instructions. Um, the second example is somebody who merely suggests a material that meets certain requirements is likely not an inventor. So if you go to a friend who's an engineer and you say, I need a metal that has certain properties, and he says, well, you should use uh, titanium, for example, um, that would not rise to the level of inventorship, um, just merely suggesting a material that meets certain criteria. Um, this slide shows the typical patent process, um, and this will vary, but just to give you an idea um, of the general kind of flow chart, um, you start, you, you'll first start off with an invention disclosure, which is shown at the top. Um, that's basically a disclosure that you put together, um, something that includes um, a general description of what you're trying to do, some hand-drawn sketches. Um, you put those together, and you go and you speak to a patent attorney to figure out what to do next. Um, that invention disclosure, as soon as the attorney gets it, um, you may do something called a patent search. Uh, compare it against what's out there in the prior art. Now, this step here um, in the light blue, um, that would be an optional step. So a patent search and the filing of a provisional application, those are both optional steps. Um, there are a couple of reasons that you want to do a patent search. First, um, if you're going to invest heavily in this, um, in your device or in your method, uh, you want to make sure that you have a shot at getting a patent. You want to make sure that there's nothing that's dead on. Um, so that would be a reason to do a patent search. Uh, but understand that patent searches are by nature never complete because they're keyword searches. And sometimes if uh, your search was centered around a certain keyword, and something in the prior art used a synonym of that keyword, it may not come up. So obviously, patent searching is sort of a, a science and an art, and the best patent searchers will find the most relevant art. Uh, but you're never going to be assured that you have or you captured 100% of what's out there. Uh, the reason I say that patent searches are optional is because whatever you uncover in your patent search, you have a duty and an obligation to hand that stuff over to the patent office. So keep that in mind when you do a patent search that you have to be diligent and you have to actually hand those references over and they could be used against you. Now, if you don't do a patent search and you're not aware of any references, um, then at that point, there's nothing for you to cite to the patent office. Um, it's a question of strategy. It's also a question of budgeting, uh, whether you're going to do a patent search or not. Um, the next step. Um, let's assume you did a patent search and nothing came up that was close to what you were trying to do. Uh, the next step would be to file either a provisional patent application or a non-provisional patent application. And I'll talk about the differences very quickly. So a provisional patent application does not get examined. Um, it merely serves as a sort of placeholder at the patent office. In order for you to ever have an issued U.S. patent, you must file a non-provisional application. Uh, typically, if you file a provisional, uh, that may be done at a reduced cost uh, because there's less formalities. Um, but actually, the best provisional applications will look exactly like non-provisional applications. Um, so, you know, the, the kind of best practices here are to basically disclose as much as you can as early as you can to the patent office. Um, I say it's optional, but typically provisional patents are a good idea for most inventors. Um, for one, 
it gives you uh, a year in which to tweak your uh, invention, um, make some certain modifications, talk to other parties, and within that year, you could uh, decide whether you want to proceed with, not, with a filing of a non-provisional application, or if you find that within that year, uh, your research and your testing, and uh, you found that the device doesn't function very well and you want to abandon it, well, you could do that without ever um, filing your non-provisional. So it's a way to uh, take kind of some of the costs and backload it a little bit and push things off one year into the future. Um, you must file a non-provisional patent application within one year of filing your provisional. So if you file a provisional and you wait a year and one day, there is nothing that you can do. Once you file your non-provisional application, the next step would be for that application to be examined. Um, typically, there's a backlog at the patent office, so you may be looking at about a year and a half, maybe two years, depending on what technology you're actually trying to patent, uh, before you get something called a USPTO office action. And an office action is basically a rejection. It's a paper that comes in from the USPTO saying that they've examined your invention, they've compared it against the prior art that's out there, and prior art is just references um, that are in the public. Um, they've compared it against the prior art, um, and they reject your application. Um, almost 98 or 99% of patent applications will get rejected at least once. Um, once you have this office action, once you have this rejection, what would happen next would be the, the applicant or his attorney uh, would respond to the office action and try to overcome those rejections. And that process will continue as long as the um, patent examiner either issues a U.S. patent or, a, or the applicant decides to abandon his application. Um, so you can see that if you have a difficult examiner or if the art is very close to what you're trying to do, you may end up with one, two, three, or multiple office actions. And examination will actually continue for as long as the applicant wants to. Um, so there's no time limit, um, at least in the U.S., and there's no number of rejections that you can receive. Um, as long as you keep paying the fees, you could keep an application alive and try to push it through. If there is a genuine disagreement between you and the patent examiner, there are ways in which you could appeal the application either to a board or maybe later on even to a district court, uh, but that happens kind of rarely and it depends on what you're trying to do mm -hmm. and certainly uh, what the budget is. One thing to note from this flowchart is that the second that you file your provisional application or your non-provisional patent application, uh, you are patent pending. So some people like to um, understand kind of when they're patent pending. It's the second that you file your provisional, and that certainly, uh, along with the legal protections, could also be used for marketing. So some practical tips here. Um, before filing, uh, make sure you take good notes and draw sketches of what your invention actually looks like. Um, the U.S. recently switched to a uh, first-to-file system and doesn't look at the day of invention. It actually looks now at when you actually filed. So it's a race to the patent office. Um, but still, it's a, it's a good idea for you to keep notes, um, even though they're not going to be looked at for dates anymore. Keep these good notes and uh, send them to your patent attorney. And uh, the better your notes, the better your patent application is going to be because it will help your attorney understand um, exactly what's, you know, what the, um, the specifics of your application are. Um, one thing that I find very useful also is to create drawings and sketches um, of your device, multiple drawings. If you have different views, include those. If you have cross-sectional views, those are great as well. Um, informal hand-drawn sketches are fine, so you don't need to go out and pay a fortune um, in trying to have someone create formal drawings. Um, you know, typically that will happen during your filing. Um, but still, you want to be able to have the best sketches that you can in order to best relay to your attorney what you're trying to do. Um, a question that I get often is, do I need to have a prototype? And while it's nice to have a prototype, it's not required by the patent office. So you don't actually need to physically make um, your device in order to have it patented. Um, 
as long as you describe it with enough um, detail and the examiner is satisfied with that, that should be sufficient. Some tips for examination. So like I said, almost all applications will get rejected at least once. Um, as a matter of fact, if you don't get a rejection and you get your claims allowed right away, more often than not, that will mean that someone made a mistake. And that mistake is that you probably claimed something that's much narrower than what you are entitled to. Um, so typically in examination, what you try to do is you try to claim as much as you can, um, and the patent examiner will kind of uh, reject that, and you'll have to narrow what you're, what you're getting. And think of this sort of like real estate. You try to uh, get as much real estate, as much land as you can, and sometimes you end up negotiating for something that is a little bit less. Another practical tip that I want to share with you are budgeting concerns. So make sure that you discuss the budget with your patent attorney from the beginning. Um, make sure you understand the certain milestones. Um, like I said in the process, um, ask you know what you know what certain things are going to cost, what is going to cost to file the application, what examination is going to cost, um, so that you could uh, be prepared for those costs if you ever. Um, go through the process. Um, also, you want to discuss a strategy that reflects jurisdictional concerns. So a U.S. patent will only give you protection in the U.S., um, but sometimes the European market is also very important, and most medical device manufacturers will also file in Europe. Uh, another popular one is Japan, and um, sometimes people file in China or Canada or other jurisdictions based on what their device is and where they think the market um, is going to be uh, relevant. So you want to make sure that you have that conversation as well about uh, where you're going to be filing, what countries or uh, what jurisdictions, and how much is going to cost so that you could take your budget and have it reflect that. Um, obviously, all these budgeting concerns will depend on your device, your market. Um, also understand that the more complicated and the more complex your device is or your method is, obviously, the more it's going to cost you. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that Japan and China and any other country that uses a foreign language, the costs for that are going to be very high uh, because you're going to have to also deal with translation costs. So if you file a patent in the US, you're filing it in English, but if you need to go and file in Japan, well, that patent needs to be translated into Japanese um, before it's filed. Um, and then if you get an office action in Japan, the office action is in Japanese, and that has to be translated back into English so that you can respond. And typically your response has to be translated back into Japanese. So there's an additional step at every step in the process, and that could really increase the cost. So always make sure that you're only filing in the countries that you want to, especially if you're going to be filing as um, a sole inventor or as a small company. Um, this uh, slide here shows a typical budget from draft to issuance, um, and this is a very, very rough estimate. Um, most of the time, it's going to be different. It may be more, it may be less. Examination, like I said, um, it's an iterative process, so you may get rejected once, twice. If you get rejected three times or five times or ten times, obviously the cost is going to go up. Um, but if you look at this as... Um, kind of three sections. Drafting of an application will usually cost you about $10,000, maybe more for some of the larger firms. Um, examination, you should probably set aside at least $10,000 to deal with rejections. Um, and you should probably set aside at least $5,000 for USPTO fees. That includes filing fees. Um, if you're going to have issuance of the patent, there's fees that go along with that. And certainly there's fees that come in um, during examination. Um, also understand that when I say $5,000 for USPTO fees, um, that would not include something called maintenance fees. So if you ever do get a granted patent, you actually have to um, pay certain fees uh, within certain windows to keep that patent in force. And if you don't pay it, then the patent will last. Um, I'd like to share the next two slides um, which 
kind of talk about, you know, why, why medical device patents are, are, are kind of a good value. And uh, this first slide is from a litigation study by PwC, and it shows the median damage awards in the top 10 industries between 1997 to 2016. And uh, you'll see that medical device patents here have the highest median damage award of any industry. Um, so on average, the median damages for all industries is about 5.8 million um, during litigation. Um, compare that to medical devices, and you're looking at about almost 20 million in median damages. So certainly there's a lot of money that exchanges hands either you know, during licensing but also during litigation. Um, the next slide is also relevant to kind of understanding the value of medical device patents. Um, medical device patents have more success at litigation than their counterparts. So again, if you look at medical devices, you have a success rate of about 40% um, compared to the overall success rate, uh, which is about 33%, uh, give or take. Um, so in the long run, medical device patents have been um, pretty lucrative. Um, and pretty successful at litigation. So um, let's shift gears here a little bit and um, look more at kind of patent basics and take a closer look at the parts of a patent. For example, I've been talking a lot about patent claims, and in a couple of minutes, I'll explain to you what those actually are. So here uh, on this slide is a cover page of a U.S. patent, and the cover page of a U.S. patent has a wealth of information. If you only have the cover page, you have uh, a lot of information at your disposal. And typically, if a client comes in and he wants to know, um, you know, whether a patent is valid or uh, whether he infringes a patent, the first thing the attorney is going to do is look at the cover page and try to gather as much information as he can. So um, as shown here, uh, marked by number one, you'll have in the upper right uh, hand corner, you'll have the patent number and you'll have the date of issuance. Um, then, as you can see in line 54, um, shown as number two, you'll have the title of the invention. Um, in three, you'll have the applicant data and the inventors. So if there's one inventor, he's going to be listed there. And if there's multiple inventors, you'll have the names of all the inventors. Uh, the applicant uh, would also be the owner. So if this was assigned to someone else, to say a Boston Scientific or a Medtronic, their name would appear um, in box number three as well. Um, in box number four, you'll see references cited. And these are U.S. patents and uh, publications that were cited during prosecution of this application. Um, so like I said, if you do a patent search, whatever patents and publications that you found, you have to hand those to the patent office, and those will be included in the uh, cited documents. Understand that a patent examiner will do his own search, and um, whatever happens during examination, that will all be listed there. So if you look at a patent and you want to understand um, other relevant patents in the area, a good place to look would be that box number four. Um, number five will show you the filing date. And uh, right below that, although it's uh, not outlined, there's a prior publication date that shows you um, when this application, uh, when the patent was first published. So it was first published in December 12, uh, 2013. In box number six, you'll see prior application data. So for example, here I could see that there was a provisional application that was filed um, in June of 2012. So you'll see here it's about three years from the time the provisional application was filed until it was granted in the upper right. It was granted in uh, 2015, September 2015. So the process does take a little bit of time. In uh, box seven, you'll see an abstract. Um, and that's usually in one phrase, um, sometimes two, in about 150 characters or less. Um, there's a short description of what the patent is about. Um, understand that the abstract is supposed to be pretty accurate, um, but sometimes it's not. So really what you want to be looking at are patent claims, which I'll talk about again um, in a few minutes. And then in box eight, there's usually a picture at the bottom of a patent application, um, which shows kind of a representative drawing um, of this patent. 
So like I said, a uh, patent cover, uh, cover page has a wealth of information. Um, there's a lot that you can learn from it. Um, you should become familiar with the contents of a cover page. Um, and if you do that, you'll be able to advance your own research because you'll be able to understand what's out there and find uh, relevant patents and patent publications and understand kind of the landscape uh, of the area that you're in. Um, some practical tips. Um, while the cover page will give you clues as to what the patent covers, the only thing that matters is the claims. Um, and I keep talking about the claims because that's the most important part of a patent. Um, patents are sequ sequentially numbered. So usually it's a 4 million, 5 million, 6, 7, 8. More recently, there's a 9 million series of patents. So if you see a 9 or an 8 and then a comma and then, um, you know, mm -hmm. three digits and then a comma and another three digits, you'll know that that's a granted patent um, that you're looking at. In contrast, uh, patent applications are typically published and they will begin with a year in which they were published. So for example, if you look at something and it has a cover page that looks exactly like the one we looked at, and I'll go back here, if it looks exactly like this cover page, uh, but in the upper right hand corner, you see that it begins instead of a 9 million number, it begins with a year, for example, 2016 uh, or 2017, then you'll know that that's a publication and not a granted patent. The next part of the uh, patent that I want to kind of explore is um, shown in nine. You'll see sheet two of seven. Sheet two of seven refers to the number of sheets of drawings uh, that are in this patent. So you want to have in your patent application, you want to have as many um, drawings as you possibly can of not only your device, but all the variations. Um, also, when you're looking at someone else's patent, you want to be able to look at those drawings because typically that's the quickest way for you to understand what the patent is about. So as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, that's definitely true for patents. Um, drawings are incredibly valuable to a patent strength. Um, oftentimes during the prosecution or the examination of a patent application, you may need to uh, change your claim. Uh, we call it amending your claim. Um, when you amend your claim, you have to have support for that claim in your specification, in your patent application, or your drawings. And sometimes you don't have the words in your application to amend your claims the way that you want to, but you could refer to the drawings. So certainly drawings are really uh, very valuable during the examination phase, and you want to have as many drawings as you can in your application. Um, some practical tips is to include as many embodiments as your budget will permit. So by embodiments, I mean different variations of your device. And sometimes a secondary embodiment, which you first thought was going to be irre irrelevant, turns out to be the most successful one. Um, so put drawings into uh, your applications and put as many variations as you can, uh, you know, as much as your budget will permit. Um, the next part of a patent that I'll talk about, uh, this will be kind of the meat uh, of the patent application mm -hmm. or your patent. Um, and this will typically be uh, your, what we call your specification. So you'll see typically your specification will be columns and columns of text. And it will start with a background of your invention. Um, after that, you'll have a brief description of your drawings. So you'll see here um, in this one, this patent had drawings one, two, three, up until drawing figure 8B. And that brief description tells you just uh, in a few words what you're looking at. And then um, in box 12 going on, that will be your detailed description. And that will describe each of those figures in more detail, and it will describe each um, of the pieces that are shown in the figures and each of the character references that are shown. Uh, let me go back here. So if you look back on this page, you'll see figure two, and you'll see different uh, reference numerals, for example, 11, 10. Each of those will be described in your specification. Um, Finally, we get to uh, what I've been talking about the whole time, uh, which is shown in the box um, with a star. And that section will begin with what is claimed as. These will be your claims. Uh, and this is really almost um, 
you know, everything that matters is going to be your claims. If you want to know what your patent protects, you look at the claim. And if you want to know if your device is going to infringe on someone else's, you look at the claim. And the claim is basically, as you see, is going to be a numbered list, uh, one, two, three, four, up until the end. And that's going to be found typically all the way at the end of your patent. Um, sometimes a published application, like I said, um, it's not an issued patent, but that will have claims as well. But understand that until something is granted, uh, those claims may change. So let's take a closer look at the claims. So like I said, protection is limited to only what is claimed. So you could have 100 or 200 or 300 page of description in your specification, um, but the claim is really going to be the scope of your protection. During prosecution, claims are searched. Um, they may be rejected, amended, or allowed. And the specification may include numerous embodiments and elements, but only subject matter claim is afforded protection, like I said. Um, the examiner is going to work with the applicant to focus the claims on novel and non-obvious aspects of the invention. And um, he's going to be afforded the broadest reasonable interpretation during examination. Um, the examiner search is also going to be able to extend into unrelated areas. So uh, you may have something, um, you know, a device in radiology, but the examiner may uh, pull out a similar device or something that might be irrelevant from, uh, let's say, the field of cardiology. Um, below here, if you see in box number one, um, I've taken claim number one from the previous patent, and I want to kind of show you what the claim actually looks like. So if you'll see, it's usually, it's one sentence. Um, sometimes it's in legalese and you'll see a bunch of semi, uh, semicolons here, uh, but it's one sentence that describes exactly what the scope of the protection is going to be. So here you have an apparatus for insertion into a body cavity comprising. Comprising is an open-ended um, term. So it's going to have all these elements, but it may have more. And here you'll see that they're claiming an apparatus that has a catheter, um, they have a main lumen and two secondary lumens. Uh, they have one outlet port, at least two infusion ports, at least one inlet, two spherical balloons, and a bunch of channels, and they're configured in a certain way. So when the examiner looks at this claim, he's going to take this claim, compare it to the prior art, and he's either going to reject or allow the claim, and if he rejects it, you have one of two options. Either you could argue that the references um, don't anticipate or don't render your claim obvious, or you could change your claim and add more language or take out language or clarify language to get away from the prior art. So now that we know what a patent is and the parts of it, um, let's talk about ownership and is this invention really yours? So absent any agreement, the default rule is that patents and other IP are owned by inventors, authors, or other creators. So um, if you don't have any agreements with anybody, uh, if there's no contract and you invent something, it's owned by you. Joint inventors would own a patent in equal shares absent a separate agreement. So if there's two inventors that have been working on something, um, they were going, they're going to share ownership um, 50 50. And um, for example, if that patent contains 200 claims and John contributed to conception of only one claim, um, while Liz contributed to the conception of the other 199 claims, both of them are going to have equal ownership rights in the patent. So as long as you contribute to at least one claim, uh, you're going to have full ownership of the patent. And um, I like to say that think of intellectual property rights as being similar to real, real, uh, real estate or uh, real, real property in, in certain respects. You can take your real estate and you could rent it to someone or you could sell it. Um, similarly, you can take your patent and you could give a license to someone to use your invention or you could assign it entirely to someone else and sell it off. Um, so um, patents, you know, can, you know, the ownership of patents can um, can change, and there are ways at the USPTO for you to look at the ownership and understand um, who owns what. 
Um, next, I'll talk a little bit about employment agreements. This is mostly relevant to physicians. So once you start working, sometimes you'll have an employment agreement, say with a hospital or a private practice, um, when you sign on, and you want to make sure that that contract, your employment agreement, um, either talks about uh, IP and the ownership of IP, um, or, or it does. You want to see what it is that you're actually signing. Um, typically, your first job out of say, uh, you know, your residency, you may not have much negotiating power to alter the language. Um, that will obviously depend on the job market. Uh, but anyway, it's good to know where you stand and what contracts you've signed, right? So check to see what your contract says about intellectual property. Um, is there language there? Is it broad? Is it narrowly tailored? Um, if you're thinking about patents, uh, make sure you speak to your attorney first. Show them your employment agreement. Um, you may want to discuss, you know, your project with your employer, uh, but definitely don't do that until you seek the advice of your patent attorney or your, your counsel first. Uh, to make sure that you're going to be fully protected and if the invention is yours, that you, you get to keep that um, to yourself. Um, if you're developing an invention while being employed by a company or hospital, um, you should take certain steps to ensure that you keep control. Um, so it's a very fact-intensive inquiry, but typically you want to make sure that you're working on your own time. You want to make sure that you're working on your own place. You're using your own money, your own resources. Um, as you develop this thing. And this is just a rule of thumb, and obviously, um, you know, fact patterns uh, will differ. Um, next, so we talk about ownership. So let's assume that you own everything outright. The next step is to find the right dance partner, as I call it, um, about licensing um, your invention. Um, why should you find a partner? Well, first, it's very difficult to bring a device to market without the right partners. Um, you're going to have manufacturing uh, challenges, logistical challenges, you may need the engineers to work with you. Um, depending on what the device is, you may need to get it through the FDA. Um, that could be also very expensive. Um, you also may not have enough time to do all this um, while still practicing medicine. Um, so to, to do it all on your own is very difficult. Uh, the most common approach is you take a um, proof of concept, take your invention, prove the concept out, um, test it if you're able to, uh, depending on what the device is. Um, you build a strong patent portfolio around your concept, and then you go out and try to find a dance par or partner with one of the larger medical device manufacturers who are going to help you take your product or your invention to the next level. Um, make sure that your invention is protected before sharing it with anyone through patents, patent filings, and um, NDAs. So definitely don't talk to any third parties before you um, make sure that your invention is protected. Um, what is an NDA? I just talked about NDAs. Um, NDA is a non-disclosure agreement, and sometimes you'll hear that referred to as a confidentiality agreement, and it's basically a legal contract between two parties that outlines confidential material to be shared and restricts their usage. Um, so, one note here is many people ask whether you need to sign the NDA with your patent attorney, and the answer is no. So there's ethics rules that bar an attorney from mishandling your confidential information or sharing it with someone else, um, and these apply to potential clients uh, as well as actual clients. Um, so a lot of times we'll have people that come in, potential clients, and will say, um, I need you to sign an NDA before I can share anything, um, and that will usually show a lack of sophistication um, because they don't really understand what the job of their patent attorney is supposed to be, and they don't understand the relationship um, between the two. Um, so as a general rule, it's unwise to discuss an invention with anyone before filing a patent application. So even though you might have an NDA in place, um, I usually recommend that you file a patent application first, whether it's a provisional or a non-provisional, uh, before discussing anything. Um, some companies actually won't even enter into discussion with someone who hasn't filed a patent application. Um, so they'll say, file first and then come, let's talk. And there's good reasons for that. Um, they may be developing a similar product, and they're not going to know that until you enter into discussion. Uh, so they don't want to be accused of theft. So they'll say, file first, and then once you file, then we'll know as of that date 
this was your invention, and if we're developing something similar, then at least the filings will show the differences between them. Um, also, filing a patent application shows that you're, you're being diligent, you're making progress um, as an inventor, and it shows that you're serious. So typically, unless you have something filed, um, companies won't even talk to you. Um, finally, I'll talk about kind of two success stories if we've got, you know, a couple minutes here. Um, and, and, and these are two uh, kind of high profile cases of uh, physicians that have used kind of that method that I've talked about of proving the concept, um, building a patent portfolio, and then finding a right dance partner. So this first one will deal with uh, coronary stents. Uh, this was Dr. Julio Palmez and uh, him and another physician they invented the first balloon expandable coronary stent to solve the problem of restenosis. Um, and this technology was licensed to J&J for about $10 million. Um, this is actually an interesting story that their earliest invent, uh, investor was Phil Romano. And some people may know Phil Romano was um, the uh, guy behind Fuddruckers and uh, Macaroni Grill. Um, and he was one of their early investors. Um, and he basically wrote him a check for 250000 to get it going. And he claimed that the two physicians, you know, uh, made him about $600 million for the three of them. And uh, he talked about, you know, he kind of recounted the story. He talked about how they, they met basically at a restaurant. And uh, they took out, one of the doctors took out a napkin and drew it for him to help him understand. Um, and that's kind of what got the project started. So, um Typically, that's, that's kind of how it happens, you know, with a, a doctor with an idea, puts it down on a napkin, works on it over the years, maybe speaks to another physician to see what he thinks of it, um, and then get IP protection, and then it's off to find the right investors and the right dance partners. Um, the next example I'll give you was Dr. Um, Henning Anderson, and he's credited with the first transcatheter heart valve. So he basically saw the stents that were in the previous slide, and he said, why can't I take that stent, uh, attach a heart valve, uh, and see if I can make a heart valve that's going to be inserted via catheter and avoid open heart surgery for my patients. Um, and this is an interesting story as well. He basically took some wire, he bent it into a frame, and he went to his lo local butcher shop um, and basically got a pig heart, and he harvested it and put it together himself. So that's typically how it happens. Very crude um, kind of uh, prototypes are made to kind of test out the functionality. Um, and this has been a huge mark in the past several years. And on the right there, you'll see the Sapien XD heart valve. Um, so obviously, you know, it's evolved a little bit from Dr. Anderson's original research, um, but those patents, uh, original patents, the 552 patents to Dr. Anderson, um, those were huge. And there were several very high profile lawsuits um, on these heart valves. Um, so thank you for your attention. Um, you know, I uh, will just st stress three different points here before uh, I take some questions. Um, first, this is probably the most important. Um, before you discuss anything with third parties, ensure that your invention is protected. Uh, don't cut corners early in the legal process. Don't go and talk to other people and publish things. Um, if you have something valuable, make sure that it's protected with IP. At least take the first initial steps of filing a provisional application first before you talk to anybody else. Um, second would be to ensure that you are, in fact, the owner of the IP. Make sure you identify the other joint inventors. Work together. Um, much better to work together and try to achieve your goals uh, rather than to go sep your separate ways and to parse out who owns what. Um, and finally, try to build your IP portfolio and find the right, par uh, right partner who's going to take you to that next level of testing, of FDA approval, uh, of getting a patent portfolio and taking on some of the, uh, the costs associated with that. Um, so with that, I'll take your questions and, and thank you for your attention. All right, thank you, Peter, for that really educational talk. Um, I learned a lot personally. Uh, we have a question here so far for everyone else. Uh, go ahead and start typing in your questions in the chat box and I'll read them out to Peter. So the first question that we have here is as far as intellectual property goes, where does computer code fall? That's a very interesting question. Um, 
computer code, you know, I, I, I tend to be in the camp to say the computer code um, is most valuable uh, under copyright. Uh, so the artistic expression, the way that you um, kind of put that code together and express it, obviously you could have code um, that has multiple forms to do the same thing. There's a certain uh, way of expressing um, what you're trying to do. So that would be covered by copyright. Uh, but also computer software could also be covered by patents as well. Um, and that's an area that my partner, um, Ellen Way, she tends to work in that area a lot. Um, and that's also kind of a, a, a hot kind of technology at the moment. Um, so uh, with computer software, computer code, um, you really want to explore the idea of protecting it via both copyright um, for the actual code um, and the functionality, if you can, try to go um, and try to get uh, patents on that as well. Um, and that's, that's a very good question. It's an example of where you can use multiple levels of IP to protect the kind of the, the same thing or, or not, not necessarily the same thing, uh, but you know, within a certain project, you might have different levels of protection. Thank you. We have another question here. Um, how do we find the right partner and what are things to look for? Um, that's also a very good question. Um, I would say that uh, if you are young and, and you have an idea, the, the first thing you should do, um, you know, after trying to do your earliest filings, um, is to reach out within um, your kind of community. So if you have uh, another physician that you consider a mentor, um, you can reach out to that or, or someone, you know, from your med school. Uh, a professor, for example, that uh, you're close to, you may try to reach out to that person um, and see if you could leverage their network. Um, another thing that may be helpful is um, typically when a physician uh, gets a payment, say for research, uh, for uh, from a medical device company as, say, a royalty, um, all of that is actually open uh, and public information. Uh, and anyone could go online and research that. Um, so you could actually go, um, and there are websites that let you go and find out what physicians are working in your field um, that are kind of active in research. Um, say I want to find, you know, an interventionalist who's active in New Jersey in research, and I find that, you know, a doctor so-and-so made, you know, whatever, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars or something, I know that he's going to be active in that field and try to find pointers from him and see um, if he'll take my call and kind of help connect me to the right people. So uh, reaching out to other physicians is very powerful. Also, there's a couple organizations. One that I recently joined is called the Society uh, of Physician Entrepreneurs. And those are other doctors that are working kind of on um, different projects, and they should direct you in the right way. Um, the other thing that you could do is you could reach out directly to medical device manufacturers. So if you've created a new piece of equipment um, and you see in your hospital that, you know, Stryker or someone else is the one that makes, you know, that catheter um, or that device, and you see that most of the market is made kind of or dominated by that one manufacturer, um, well, that would be the person to go to and try to find either their IP counsel um, or someone in research within that organization um, and, you know, um, try to start the discussion. You know, I have a patent application on this. I want to see if you guys would be interested um, and then see where it goes. But it's a lot of networking, um, a lot of relying on, you know, your, your friends, um, your coworkers to try to meet the right people. All right, we're getting some more questions here. Uh, another one, when developing ideas under employment by a hospital or university, uh, how can you prove that the idea uh, in your, that the ideas in your patent were worked on in your own time and, and that they therefore belong to you? Um, again, you want to make sure that first you look at your employment contract. Um, so this will only be an issue if you have, you know, an employment contract um, where it's, uh, you know, very much stacked against you, the language, that, you know, doesn't favor you. Um, in that case, I would be very careful about, you know, what I do and um, take the notes and record, you know, what I did if I did some testing or something, you know, at home or, or I built something. I, I want to make sure that I record all of that. Um, if you don't have an employment agreement or IP is not an issue, 
Um, so you want to make sure that you're kind of mindful of these issues. Um, so like I said, make sure you, you know, use your own resources. You know, you, you don't want anyone to come and say that you are doing this, you know, basically for us at the time um, or that this was part of your position. Um, this happens more for engineers than it does for physicians, I would have to say. Um, so most of the time, you know, engineers, biomedical engineers that work for medical device companies, um, that's the sole reason for their employment. And there's almost an automatic assignment for most of this stuff. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but um, whoever asked that, feel free to follow up if you have something more specific. Uh, we have a related question here. So if an employment agreement makes broad claims to anything medically related, even if performed outside of work, is that enforceable? And what are recommendations regarding approaching an employer with an idea other than getting assistance from a lawyer? Yeah, I, I, I say that, that that's a question that's very fact specific and will go to your lawyer. But certainly if the terms are so onerous and the language is so broad, um, chances are that it's not going to be enforceable. Uh, I mean, if, if basically language says that um, we own any IP that you've created or are going to create outside of work, um, you know, that, that, that's usually not going to be language that ends up in the contract anyway. Uh, but if it is, that, that's probably void. Okay. Uh, do you have any suggestions for a resident who's just starting out having uh, a big research background and interested in extending this to the development of devices? Yeah, certainly if you um, understand where the problems are, and uh, we were talking about this before the call, but sometimes physicians really are in the best place to understand um, where the problems or the pain points are. Uh, you're, doing, you're doing a procedure and you see that something is taking a, you know, a long time um, or that there's some problem with this device that could be better. Usually the physician is the first person to understand that. So once you know what that problem is and you start to solve it, uh, you're, you're off to the races. And you don't really need that much in terms of resources or money to get started. Um, like I said, what you need to do is uh, get a provisional filed um, and then from there kind of open up your network and see who's willing to take you the next step and help you out. Uh, but really the, the only step you need to take uh, before doing anything else, I would say is filing a provisional patent application. Okay, another question we have here. If an inventor does a patent landscape search and drafts the initial specifications before contacting legal counsel, how much will this impact the cost of drafting the patent? Um, it will depend. You know, uh, sometimes it's helpful to know what other um, devices are out there. So if you give a very good disclosure um, of your device, you, you, you know, it's very thorough. You know, so some, some inventors will give us, you know, a couple sketches and that will be it. And we have to kind of figure out what they're trying to, to do. Um, other inventors will give us, you know, five or six pages of very well thought out and detailed notes. Um, those are really the best inventors to work with. Um, and if on top of that, you could say also, here are the related devices. Here is how they work. And here, here's how ours is superior or different. Um, that's very powerful. And yes, that, that will save money, um, especially during prosecution. Uh, I say prosecution, that means examination. That will save money in the long run, too, uh, because your claims are going to be focused. Um, your patent attorney, you know, at that point, when he's aware of, you know, what you found, should be able to craft claims that are directed exactly to what you're trying to cover, and the examination process will be shortened. So if you could do research on your own, um, do um, you know some searching on your own and find out you know what's the most uh, relevant and the closest prior art and give that to your patent attorney. Um, you know that that's very helpful. But understand again that whatever you find, um, you absolutely must give it to the patent office. Um, you have to keep notes and you have to uh, hand that over to your patent office to make sure that you guys um, are following all the rules uh, with the USPTO. Now, the last thing you want to do is put a lot of time and money into a patent um, only to have it be unenforceable because you didn't follow the disclosure rules. Okay, some uh, another question along the same lines. Uh, what is the best way to go about in conducting a patent search to see if there's any existing devices that are similar? Um, 
that, that's an interesting question. So, you know, there's basically two resources. Um, one is uh, if you go to google.com backslash patents, uh, that's a very uh, nice database that is pretty complete. Um, you know, you can just do some keyword searches, uh, kind of get an idea of what's out there, um, you know, type some different keywords, different variations, see if you get anything different and read through some of the patents. Like I said, the cover page will tell you a lot. Um, Google Patents is, is a very good resource, uh, but sometimes it's not as updated um, as, say, the USPTO website is, uh, which might be a little bit harder to use, um, at least at the outset, until you understand kind of how to do their Boolean searches and all of that. Um, but the Patent Office search is going to be the most complete. Um, and even though it's a little bit more difficult, um, that's, that's really the place that you go and look. So they have two databases. They have one for published applications, and they have one for issued patents, and you should be looking at both. Um, one thing to also understand about searching is that every patent and publication is going to be classified by the patent office into a certain grouping. And you could go and look into that class to see um, what different devices or methods are in there. So in the old days, uh, this is before I started my practice, uh, they actually used to have all the patents related to a certain device, uh, they would put them in these shoe boxes and you would go to the patent office if you want to do a search and you'd pull out the shoe box and you basically just shuffle through the papers and look to see what's relevant. Um, now, obviously, everything is electronic. So as long as you know what class you should be looking in, and you know, sometimes you do a certain keyword search and then you find the relevant class and then you plug in that class and then you can look at all the, all, all the uh, patents and publications in that class that will really give you the best results because um, a keyword search is, you know, it's, it's going to be limited uh, just by nature. Okay, a couple more uh, questions here. Uh, what do you do after your provisional patent runs out, but you still want to continue pursuing the patent to the next level, but you stopped uh, due to um, not enough funds? Yeah, like, like I said, once you file your provisional, that one year clock that's ticking, uh, once that expires after a year, if you haven't converted it, um, there's really nothing you can do. Um, you know, there, there's, there's, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any recourse after the one year period. I don't think there is one. Um, now, what you could do is if you want to take your idea and modify it a little bit and try to go after some modification, uh, you could try to do that and file a different application. Um, but really, you know, you should be aware of that one year, and that's really a race for you to develop your, your idea. So, so don't, don't bank on any more time than that one year. And typically, your attorney will reach out at, you know, nine or ten months or something like that to, to see, you know, what, what have you done and is this going to keep going? You know, it'll give you kind of a, you know, a few weeks. And um, you never want to file on that last day, you know. Sometimes the patent office website goes down, so you always want to leave a little bit of a cushion. Okay, last question we have for the night here. Is there a resource to find a good IP lawyer in my area? Um, yeah, I, I would say find someone. The best way to do it is to find someone um, not in your area. I would say look more at competency rather than geography. So you don't want to find someone um, that's down the street from you um, but his practice is in computer software, for example, um, when you're trying to go after a surgical method, uh, because there's different rules. Uh, for example, in, there's a lot of rules in Europe about medical devices uh, that are very specific to medical devices. Um, so you want to find somebody that kind of works in your area, and uh, a patent attorney is going to be, um, you know, someone that's able to, to practice anywhere. It's not like um, you know, state bar membership, um, where you're permitted to practice, for example, if you're licensed in New Jersey, you could only do, um, you know, insurance law in only New Jersey. Uh, patents are, you know, fe under federal law. So if you find somebody in Alaska, but that's the best person, um, you, you go directly to that person. I wouldn't go to the person that's closest to me. Um, you know, most of our clients now um, are in other states anyway. Um, so that's, that's very common for people to work across state lines. Okay, thank you, Peter, for um, this insightful and 
really educational talk and thank you for taking the time out to talk to us. We really appreciate it uh, and I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone who attended tonight uh, that we all learned a lot from this talk. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, John. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, if anybody has any follow-up questions or just wants me to direct them to the right resource, uh, I'd be more than happy to. Uh, I'll just give a, a final plug to that Society of Physician Entrepreneurs. I think it's a, it's a very nice organization um, and it's mostly physicians and that's a very good resource if you're looking to get started uh, kind of in the field. Okay, well, thank you very much, Peter. We really appreciate you taking the time to teach all of us about intellectual property. And um, last announcement to everyone, once again, this web webinar is recorded and it will be posted under RFS Education on YouTube. And that's it for tonight. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank Good you. Night.